Turn with me to uh, Luke's gospel and find chapter 11, if you would, please. Uh, Luke chapter 11. We're looking together this morning at the first 13 verses of Luke 11. The title of the message is How to Pray. How to Pray. And I pray that we will be helped by uh, the Lord's words this morning. Uh, Luke chapter 11 and verse 1, now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, uh, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. So I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Well, it has been often said that if you want to humble somebody, ask them about their prayer life. Because every transparent follower of Christ in this room will admit, if we're being honest, that we do not pray as often as we should pray. Prayer is, in my opinion, the, the spiritual discipline that's often the most lacking in our lives. Now, I do not want to shame us about prayer today. I fear that too often in teaching on prayer that shame is the dominant tone of which I acknowledge my own guilt in doing so. I want you, however, to view prayer for what it is, an opportunity. An opportunity. You see, prayer is the primary expression of our fellowship with God. It's an opportunity that God has given for His people to approach Him and to converse with Him and to pour out our hearts to Him. What a great opportunity. So so I I, I don't want to shame us about what we're not doing in prayer this morning. Instead, I want to encourage us to pray. I want the scripture to help us better this opportunity and strengthen our prayer life to perhaps a level of intimacy with God that we have yet to reach. Before we go any further, I think the greatest argument for the necessity of prayer in our lives is that Jesus himself prayed. Just think about that for a moment. Jesus himself prayed. 
That's how Luke 11 begins. Verse 1 opens up by saying, now Jesus was praying. He was praying. God himself, God himself in his humanity is practicing the spiritual discipline of prayer. In fact, prayer was a regular part of his life. We, we could literally spend all morning going to just the passages in the Gospel of Luke alone that show us all the times that Jesus prayed. T time doesn't allow us to do that, but do let me read to you a summary of Jesus' prayer life this morning. That summary is given to us in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7 reads, In the days of his flesh, that is when God was Man on this earth, Jesus. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Jesus prayed. Wouldn't it have been an awesome thing to hear Jesus pray? Can you imagine? Can you imagine being among those who heard him offer up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears? Jesus committed himself to prayer. And on this particular occasion, the disciples asked him if he would be so kind as to teach them how to pray. Again, verse 1, Lord, teach us to pray. So let's learn how to pray this morning from Jesus. And here's the first thing that I want to tell us about practically as we learn how to pray is that we need to first follow the pattern Jesus taught. That's the first thing we see here. Follow the pattern Jesus taught. From verse 2 to verse 4, Jesus says, here's how to pray. Here's how to pray. This is what you say if you want to pray. Now what I want to do is break it down into seven statements of instruction. Seven statements of instruction that Jesus gives to all of us as a pattern to follow in order to learn how to pray. And here's the first thing that we see. Number one, pray to God your Father. Pray to God your Father. Jesus said in verse 2, when you pray, say, Father. Father, pray to God, your Father. This is so important because we don't pray to angels. We, we don't pray to saints who are already in heaven. We don't pray to Jesus' mother, Mary. Jesus instructs us to pray in one direction. Pray to God. Pray to God. And I add this morning, pray to the triune God. The triune God. You see, when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we discover the Trinitarian nature of prayer. That the triune God is involved in every facet of prayer. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. For instance, we pray to God the Father in the name of God the Son and with the help of God the Holy Spirit. We learn this in the Gospels. We learn this in the book of Romans. We pray to God the Father in the name of God the Son and with the help of God the Holy Spirit. So one of the first things that we're learning about prayer is that we, we don't pray to saints. We don't pray for our family members who have already deceased. We, we don't pray to angels. We, we, we pray to God and we pray to the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But the other thing that I don't want you to miss about this is, is the personal nature of prayer. Pray to God believing that he is your father and that you are his child. Think about that. Jesus says, when you pray, pray, Father. Now, he could have given us any address of God to make in that moment. He could have simply said, pray to God. Pray to 
Jehovah Nissi. Pray to whatever other name we could put in the blank. But he says, I want you to pray addressing him as Father. Father. He is reminding us here of the personal nature of prayer. That God is our Father and that we are his children. It's the language of affection. Affection. I love hearing my kids say, Daddy. It was a little more meaningful, not to take away from the other three, but I think you understand this. It was a little more meaningful when Jaden, our adopted son, said, Daddy. It's the language of affection. It's, it's the language of security, right? Security. God is my father. I am his child. It's, it's the language of confidence. You may not listen to me, but my father will listen to me. It's confidence. Think about it this way. He, he rules and reigns the universe, but yet he's your father. He hung the stars in the sky, but yet he's your father. He knows everything that's going on all around the world at the exact same time, yet he is your father. He made you. He adopted you. He loves you unconditionally. He is committed to you as his child. Christians, when you pray, pray to God your father. Father. Secondly, pray the Bible. Pray the Bible. Now, what we're reading from this morning is the word of the Lord. This is Jesus speaking here. And every word has been recorded for us as Scripture, the Bible. And I don't want us to overlook that, and I don't want to simplify it. I just want us to see it for what it is. Because on a fundamental level, when we pray, we should be praying the Bible. We should be praying the Bible. We should be praying in accordance with the Bible, not in opposition of the Bible, (laughs) We should be praying God's word. Some of you are well, well, how do I even know what to pray? I'm not even sure what to pray. Well, that's where the Bible comes into hand. We open our Bible perhaps to a, to a psalm. The psalms is a prayer book. It's given to us to guide and to teach us how to pray. Open the Bible to a psalm. Read the psalm and then pray that psalm back to God. Think about it in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Father, I just want to thank you for being my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Father, thank you for being the shepherd who guides me and leads me, and I don't want any other shepherd. I just want you to hear me this morning, God. I don't want any other shepherd but you. And on and on we pray. And so to help you with this, and many of you have already got this copy of this resource before, at the information desk today, there is a simple little book that I want to give out for free to anyone who has it. It's simply called, Pray the Bible. It's written by a professor from Southern Seminary, Donald Whitney. It is a wonderful resource. It's short. Those of you who prefer picture books, I just want to encourage you. It's short. You can handle it. Stop by the information desk. Say, hey, give me that book that Pastor talked about this morning because we need to learn how to pray the Bible. Pray the Bible. And so what Jesus is giving us here is his word. Pray the word. Thirdly, pray by yourself and with others. Pray by yourself and with others. So we are to pray alone and we are to pray together. We are to pray alone, we are to pray together. We are to pray by ourselves, we are to pray with others. Notice the use of the plural pronouns here in the Lord's Prayer. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Of course, at Laurel, we practice this in our weekly gatherings. We practice this in our discipleship groups. But I want to encourage you to perhaps even consider practically seeking out some prayer partners in your life. People that you can go to and pray with on a regular basis. People that you know you can trust and you can share your burdens. It doesn't have to be 10 people. It could be two people. 
I have those people in my life. I have those people when I am weighed down and overburdened. I, I pick up that phone or I say, hey, let's meet for lunch. I, I need to pray. I need to pray. I live. We're talking about how to pray. Pray alone, yes, in your closet by yourself, but pray with other people. Pray with other people. Several years ago, and I don't know why this story has stuck with me. I guess it was the language that was used, but uh, David Wisnett, you may know the name. David Wisnett is a reporter. He handles a lot of the uh, issues that go on in Cabarrus County, Rowan County. He's with WBTV, so anytime anything's going out this direction, he's the one covering. He's, he's the small town guy. He's also a follower, follower of Christ. And uh, David Wisnett, uh, several years ago, was doing a report about a young four-year-old girl who had fallen into a pool swimming pool in the middle of the summertime. Because of the time that she was in there and did not know how to swim, when they finally got to her, she was completely unconscious. And so they, they do a report about this girl and her well-being. And at the time of the report, uh, she was in a trauma center in Rowan County on a ventilator. So he's going through the news. He's talking about what's happened. He's, he's, he's laying out her condition. And he's doing it in front of a church. Because that little girl's church that evening had come together in their auditorium. And he's giving his report of what's going on on the basis of what he sees the people doing inside this church. And, and one, of the, one of the reporters at the news desk said, so, 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 so what are the people coming together to do? And that's when David responded. He said, the people are coming together to do what people of faith do. Pray. Pray. They're doing what people of faith do. We pray. And may it be a reminder to us that no matter what is going on in our lives, Jesus has not only given us the opportunity to approach him on our own, but to approach him in the assembly of God's people. Let's do what people of faith do. Let's pray. Let's pray by ourselves. Let's pray together. He says here, the fourth thing, pray that God's name will be glorified. We're talking about the pattern, right? Pray to God your Father, pray the Bible, pray by yourself, pray with others. And then fourthly, pray that God's name will be glorified. When you pray, pray that God's name will be glorified. Uh, that brings us to the phrase, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Now, hallowed is not a word that we use very often in our modern English language, but to hallow something is to treat it as holy, to set it apart from everything else, to reverence it. Above anything and everything. So Jesus is teaching us that we are to constantly pray that the name of God will be glorified in all things and above all things. Pray that the name of God will be glorified in all things and above all things. That's the chief purpose of man. That's what the Westminster Shorter Catechism has taught us for years. What is the chief purpose of man? Well, the chief purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We are to glorify God, glorify God. The existence of this church is to glorify God. Your work, whatever it is, your family, your life, your money, your decisions, your decisions, all of it, all of it is to glorify God's name. All of it. And Jesus says, I want you to pray to that end. I want you to pray, Lord, please glorify your name as I go to work today. Please glorify your name in the lives of my family, in how we talk to each other, in how we respond to each other, in how we serve each other. Lord, please glorify your name when we come together as a church this morning. Oh, Lord, thank you for this bonus. It's, it's very well needed in these econ economic times, but glorify your name with this money, Lord. Lord, I've got a big decision in front of me, and I don't know where we're going and what's going on, and Lord, I'm so confused, and I'm hurting, and I'm challenged, but one thing I want you to know is I want you to be glorified in all of it, whatever it is and however you lead me. This is the prayer. That when we pray, pray that God's name will be glorified. Number five, uh, pray with focus on God's kingdom. 
Pray with focus on God's kingdom. Jesus said, when you pray, pray this. Your kingdom come. In Matthew's gospel, he adds an additional phrase that Jesus uses in this moment. Matthew chapter 6 tells us that in addition to praying your kingdom come, also pray your will be done. They go together. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Prayer is not about our will. It's about God's will. Prayer is not about my kingdom. It's about his kingdom. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. And we do that best when we pray for the kingdom of God to be first in our life. You see, to pray your kingdom come is to pray that all other kingdoms will be set aside, including your own. Are you willing to pray that, by the way? Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. Not my will, your will. Not my kingdom, your kingdom. It's it's not only to pray for the destruction of Satan's kingdom. It's to pray for the demolishment and the abandonment of my kingdom. Your kingdom come, Lord, not my kingdom. Your kingdom. To pray your kingdom comes means that the kingdom of God will be expanded. It's a desire for the kingdom of God to grow. And how does the kingdom of God grow? Through the gospel. Through the sharing of the gospel and the preaching of the gospel and the declaration of the gospel. And so when we pray your kingdom come, we're praying for more people to be saved and for the gospel to go to the ends of the world that everyone, everyone might hear and know that there is a God in heaven that loves them and a Savior who died for them. And if they will by faith trust in him, they will be saved. That's how the kingdom of God grows. So when we pray your kingdom come, We're praying for God's kingdom to grow and to be expanded and that the gospel will go forth unhindered. It also means we are praying for the perfect and complete kingdom to come. Now, we are God's kingdom. God began his kingdom when he came to this earth. He came preaching the kingdom of God. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the already and the not yet. We are already, as followers of Christ, in the kingdom of God, but we are not yet to the point of Christ's perfect kingdom. Well, when's that going to happen? When he comes again. When he comes again. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes again, he will eradicate every other false kingdom. He will return this earth back to its perfect creation, and God himself will rule and reign for all of eternity. So when we pray, God, your kingdom come, we are also praying, Lord, come quickly. Come quickly. That's how the whole Bible ends. It ends with John praying for the kingdom of God to come. Come quickly, Lord. Come quickly, Lord. Do you pray for the return of Jesus? I mean, do you pray for it? Oh, it's easy to get in a Bible study and speculate it, but I'm asking, do you pray for it? Do you pray for it? Lord, may your kingdom come. Lord, may you return to this earth. May your kingdom, your will be first in my life. And number six, we're talking about the pattern. Pray to confess sin. This is the sixth thing that Jesus gives. Remember, we're talking about seven points of instruction. The sixth instruction is pray to confess sin. Pray to confess sins. Uh, Verse six says, forgive us our sins. Now, this is one of those those phrases to remind us that, and and it can't be changed. It's been used by this for all of history, but it can't be changed. We, We call this the Lord's Prayer, but this is not the Lord actually praying for these things because he has no sin to be forgiven. It's, it's better to refer to this as the model prayer, okay? It's the, it's, it's the model prayer that the Lord gave us to follow, okay? But we're not, we're not setting out to change all of church history today, okay? The Lord's Prayer, model prayer, whatever. But he's telling us, he's telling us that when we pray, we're to pray to confess our sins. Now, why would he ask us to do that? Especially knowing that theologically, when Jesus died, he died to forgive all our sins. Past, present, future. Well, I think it's an important point because because it, it reminds us that not only do we sin, John says to believers in 1 John chapter 1, if you say as a believer that you don't sin, you're a liar and the truth doesn't abide in you. Because even believers sin. We sin. 
So he's telling us not only do we sin, but he's also telling us that there is forgiveness of sin in Christ on account of what he has done for us. Think about it like this. The Christian life is a life of repentance. And it's not something that we do one time in our life in terms of repenting of our sin. Yes, when we come to Christ in faith for that moment of salvation, we are repenting of our sin. But listen, I have to repent of sin every day of my life. Every day of my life. My baseball team lost yesterday. I had to repent of a lot of sin that I felt and experienced and said during that game. Repentance is an everyday part of life, even for the believer, because it's not yet a life of perfection. The Christian life is not a life of perfection. It's a life of repentance. And through confession and repentance of sin, we can go to our Father knowing that He stands ready to forgive us and ready to restore us because of what Christ has already done. 1 John 1, 9 is written to the family of God who sin. If you, child of God, if you confess your sin, he, your father, is faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So make it a regular habit in your prayers every day to confess your sins to God. Confess them in brokenness over your sin. And confess them in assurance about your Savior. And I think at the ground level, that's why we are to confess our sins to God every day. Because he wants us to live as imperfect people with the absolute assurance that God has forgiven us. And he will not hold that sin against us. So when I confess my sin, my heart breaks that I have rebelled against him again. And it bothers me to my core that I know, that I know that I'm going to rebel against him tomorrow. He's not called us to perfection. He's called us to repentance. And the joy of repentance is knowing that he always, he always, warmly, graciously, compassionately welcomes us back. Richard Sibbs, the great Puritan of the 18th century, said there is more mercy in Christ than there is sin in us. So pray to confess your sins to God. And then the seventh thing, pray with dependence on God for all things. Pray with dependence on God for all things. You know, that's ultimately what prayer is, isn't it? It's expressing our faith in and dependence on God. So, so Jesus teaches us to bring all of our needs to God through prayer. Bring your physical needs to God, whatever they may be. The example that he gives us here is to give us each day our daily bread. It's, it's a one-liner showing us that we are to pray and ask God for our daily physical provisions. For our daily physical provisions. Whatever it is you're carrying. What, whatever material need that you have, depend upon God for that. You can bring it to God. You can seek God for it. Give us this day our, our daily bread, our physical needs, our relational needs, our relational needs. Perhaps you sit here this morning with some tension in some relationships, offense and hurt. This, this request for forgiveness is in connection to also our need to forgive others. Well, I don't know about you. I don't in my sinful flesh particularly like forgiving others. I prefer to hold it against them. I prefer to pout at them, to be mad at them. Well, since we're confessing sins, why don't you start with some of yours too? Let's just be honest. It is not in our human nature to forgive. So how do we forgive? By depending on Christ to do what we do not want to do by our human nature. That's why he's saying pray these things. Pray with dependence on God for your physical needs, for your relational needs, for your spiritual needs. Lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. 
It's recognizing that any spiritual <coughs> victory and success in my life is only accomplished when God, when God is working through me. You see, he's the Lord of all things. He's the provider of all things. And he is glorified when we depend on him for all things. It's praying, Father, we need your provision over our necessity. We need your grace to forgive those who have hurt and offended us. We need your guidance to keep us from sin. And this kind of praying recognizes that we are nothing and can do nothing apart from the sovereign help of God. So the title of the sermon this morning is How to Pray. And Jesus says, here's the first thing that you need to do. You need to follow this pattern. You need to follow this pattern. Now, I know some of you are worried, but I had already intended to spend much more time on the first one than I do the next 16. Here's the second one. Approach God shamelessly. All right? We're following the pattern that Jesus taught. And if we, if we want to learn how to pray, we need to learn how to approach God shamelessly. So in verses 5 through 8, I'm not going to read it, but Jesus now tells an illustration about a man who goes to a friend's house in the middle of the night. Don't you love those kind of friends? And he goes to his house in the middle of the night asking for bread. Knocking on the door. Hey, somebody's at my house and I'm out of food. Do you have any bread? Well, the man inside the residence hollers out, what are you doing? It's midnight. My wife is in the bed. I'm in the bed. My children are in bed. Go home. I'm not getting up to get you any bread. But the text uses the word impudence here to describe the friend's approach. And I want to try to help us understand that word. Because this friend knows it's late at night. He's quite aware of that. He knows he's asking for something that is inconvenient. But he also knows that the man upon whose door he is knocking is not a random stranger. It's his friend. It's his friend. And if anyone's going to help him, he knows that it's this friend, sleeping or not. So impudence describes this framework, this state of mind. He's coming to his friend shamelessly, unafraid that it's inconvenient unembarrassed that it's in the middle of the night. He's coming shamelessly to ask him for this specific need. And the inference is that he did this repeatedly and passionately. I don't know if it's just by banging on the door or hitting the ring doorbell. I'm not sure. But he over and over and over again. And it was on account of that approach that the grouchy friend got out of bed and gave him the bread that he needed. Now, here's what Jesus is teaching us about, friend, uh, about prayer. If a grouchy man in the middle of the night can be talked into helping his shamelessly asking friend, how much more then will a loving God who never slumbers, who never sleeps, who's never grouchy, respond to our shamelessly asking of him? And that's the point he's making. When you pray, don't pray sheepishly. Pray shamelessly. Pray boldly. Pray courageously. Because he invites you to do that. He invites you to come to him any time, in the middle of the day or in the middle of the night. He comes, invites you to come to him anywhere. He comes, invites you to come to him with any request. And we ought to be unafraid and unembarrassed to do so. That's the point. So if you're learning how to pray and you're trying to grow in this area, follow the pattern Jesus established, taught us, and then approach God shamelessly. Don't be afraid and don't be embarrassed to come to God anytime, anywhere, with any need. Thirdly, be persistent. Be persistent. 
In other words, don't quit praying. Don't quit praying. Jesus then goes on to tell them, ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, it'll be opened. It's language of persistence. Keep praying. Don't quit coming to God. In fact, each one of these actions build upon the other. Pray, pray regularly, pray constantly. Pray, pray regularly, pray constantly. Ask, ask, seek, knock. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. In other words, don't hang up. Stay on the line. It's what Paul called in 1 Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Maintain in your spirit and in your soul a persistent, continual fellowship with God through prayer. And that goes beyond the dinner table into a constant, every moment awareness of the present and active relationship we have with God. Let's say that again. It goes beyond the dinner table It goes beyond the dinner table into a constant, constant, every moment awareness of the present and active relationship we have with God. Now, why does Jesus emphasize this part of prayer so strongly? Because listen carefully. Prayer, prayer is directly linked to our sanctification. Sanctification means our practical Christian living. The more persistent we are to pray for the things he told us to pray for, the more faithfully committed we will be to God in those areas. Prayers lead to our sanctification. For example, the more you pray for the one who's offended you and hurt you, the more your heart will desire to forgive them. The more you pray for Christ's kingdom to come, the more you'll share the gospel with others. The more you confess your sins to God, the more you'll grow tired of having to confess those sins to God. The more you pray for God to be glorified, the more conscientious you will be about glorifying your na- his name. Here's the point. The point is this. If you're not persistently communing with God in prayer, then the purifying work of your spiritual life will be to some extent hindered from experiencing the transforming grace of nearness to God. So he wants us to pray and to pray constantly and to pray persistently because it is connected to our Christian life, our Christian growth, our sanctification. Think about it like this, and I'll move on. Those who live without prayer live without the fullness of God's power. Now, he's going to go with you anywhere, everywhere, all the time. He is always with us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. But to live without awareness of that presence and communion of that presence is to live without the power of God to be who Christ saved us to be, like him. So be persistent in your prayer. Whatever your struggle is, whatever your secret sin, keep praying about that. Keep confessing it. Keep coming to God. Ask, seek, knock, don't quit. Because God's going to use that prayer in your life to sanctify your heart and becoming more like him. So here's the fourth and final thing. Some of you are scared. There are really not 16. (laughs) How to pray. Follow the pattern Jesus taught. Approach God shamelessly. Be persistent. And then number four, expect to receive the Father's goodness. Expect to receive the Father's goodness, verses 11 through 13. And I believe this lie, uh, herein lies the big misunderstanding about prayer, that we can ask God for anything we want, and like a genie, he should grant those requests. But that is both unbiblical and an unfilling expectation. What we should expect to receive always, always, is the Father's goodness. The Father's goodness. All right, here's how he says it in the illustration, verse 11. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, now I get it. I watch a lot of court TV. Some earthly fathers can be extremely cruel. 
But for the most part, for the most part, fathers love their children. In fact, despite all the challenges there are in parenting, we still enjoy giving our children good gifts. If they ask for eggs, we're not going to give them a scorpion. We might even give them something better than eggs. We might give them pancakes, which is better than eggs. But we're not going to give them a scorpion sandwich when they ask for eggs for breakfast. That's not how it works. Uh, Christmas is coming. Did you know that? 78 days away. I had that. I had to look that up, okay? I don't want you to think I'm already decorating the house with tinsel. I had to look that up. 78 days away. Now, sometimes my kids, as they're already doing, will ask for the silliest things for Christmas. Gifts that Kathleen and I know are going to break, unravel, or be forgotten about before we ever get to New Year's Day. So, I don't always give them exactly what they ask for. Instead, I try to give them something better, something better, something that I know will last, that will not unravel, that they will hold and cherish for quite a long time. And I do that because I love giving them good gifts. And if it's in my ability to do so, I want to give them the best gifts that I can. That's the point Jesus is making. If an imperfect earthly father works hard to give his children good gifts, then how much more will our perfect heavenly father give his children good gifts? Now, whether you believe it or not, God has never given his children anything but the best. And sometimes that means he says no to what we're asking for so that he can say yes to what is best for us, including, as he mentions here, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit. And I think the reason why he puts this in here is to remind us because sometimes we're not going to get what we're seeking after. We're going to get something better. We're going to get the Holy Spirit to help us through whatever lie ahead for us. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He goes with us. He strengthens us. He protects us. He guides us. He gives us peace in all of life's circumstances. So the point here is when you pray, when you pray, you come praying, expecting and believing that God is going to answer your prayers. Believe that. Expect that. God will hear you and God will respond to you. But it's not always according to our desires. It is, however, always according to his perfect fatherly goodness. I heard Legan Duncan say at one time, I've quoted it many times, I think it's original with Calvin, but here's what he says, God's answers are always better than our prayers. God's answers are always better than our What an opportunity prayer is for us, amen? Amen. And if your prayer life isn't what it should be today, then start fresh. Start fresh. Don't be shamed this morning. No, go home determining with God's gift of the Holy Spirit in your life, you're going to follow the pattern. You're going to come to God unafraid and unembarrassed. You're going to keep coming to God in prayer, and you are going to come believing, expecting to receive the Father's goodness in all your prayers. Now, the most important prayer you'll ever pray is a prayer that confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior. And there's another promise. Romans 10, 9, if you pray, confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior, believing in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, then God is not your Father. And if God is not your father, then prayer in your life is meaningless. God hears the prayers of his children. And his children are those who follow Jesus Christ as Lord. 
And we want to help you with that. So if there is any question in your heart whatsoever that God is my father and I am his child, then please let us take some time with you before you leave today and show you how much Jesus loves you, how much God wants to adopt you into his family if you will simply confess him in faith, believing who he said he was. And may God help all of us to leave this morning a little more encouraged and strengthened about our prayer life. Let's stand together as we pray.